So I'm going to talk today about um, cultural mismatch. It's going to be a bit of a, of, a re, of a review of some of the research I've done over the past decade or so. Um, and I think it's going to be centered around this notion of, of cultural mismatch, where probably to many in the audience, this is familiar territory, but I think it's an insight that um, is particularly important for economics and economic policy. And so that's kind of one thing I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so probably the first things to fix ideas is to, to define culture, which is socially learned information, which is stored in our brains, internalized, which affects human behavior. So uh, norms, values, beliefs, knowledge. Um, and that's the classic definition from Boyd and Richardson, uh, for example. In today's talk, what I'll be talking about, as I mentioned, is cultural mismatch and the extent to which it helps us understand the world around us particularly big picture important issues like uh, economic growth, political issue, issues, uh, social issues, uh, crisis and well-being. And then also it helps us, I think, understand um, policy. So how do we move forward and try and improve the world given uh, the way it is? So I thought it would be helpful. Hopefully this isn't too dry for people. It's but to actually have a theoretical framework um, and to think about this carefully uh, within this theoretical framework. So there's a lot of models one could use. So um, a ton by Boyd and Richardson that one could use. I'm gonna use Alan Rogers, his classic model from 1988, uh, just because it's the simplest model. And I love to present this to economists. It's the simplest model that I think illustrates two or three super important points. So just very quickly um, to review the model, a society consists of a large population of individuals. Each um, generation or each period and, and, or each period, a new generation is born and the older generation dies. Okay. There's two actions. Um, each period, the new generation chooses either action A or B. There's also two states of the world. Here I'm calling cap, cap A, cap B. And in one of the states, the one action is optimal. And here's a payoff matrix where in environment A, action small A is optimal. Okay. So you can't observe the environment and there's shocks each period. And with some probability cap delta, uh, there's a shock. And when there's a shock, there's a probability that you're equal probability that you're in environment A or B. Okay. So the, the issue here is, well, how do I choose what's, what action I take uh, uh, after I'm born as, as a new generation or as an individual from a new generation? So in the model, there's two player types. Uh, there's what I'll call uh, non-traditionalists, or you might think of these as homo economicus or uh, rational economists. They ignore tradition, engage in trial and error, and learn the optimal action with certainty. So they go, go out, collect information, um, and figure out what's the optimal action, okay? And this comes at a cost kappa, okay? And there's another type, these are what I'll call traditionalists, but these individuals engage in culture and cultural learning and social learning. And they're gonna adopt the action or mimic the action of a randomly chosen person, a representative person from the previous generation. So the benefit of this is that uh, culture is costless. Okay, so they don't bear the cost kappa. And I'm gonna let denote, uh, sorry, X denote the proportion of traditionalists or the amount of culture that exists in the economy. Okay, so then you get this well-known figure, right? And basically um, it's showing the payoffs of the two types. So the payoffs to the uh, non-traditionalists is this flat line. The x-axis is the proportion of traditionalists in the economy. So what they do is they go out, bear the cost kappa and get the benefit beta because they choose the optimal action in each period. That doesn't matter what, what's going on around them. So it's independent of what's going around on around them. So it's a flat, flat line. Whereas the traditionalists, basically what they're doing is they're copying someone from the previous generation. If the environment doesn't change, so in other words, delta is zero, then they'll get beta, right? If the environment changes, then there's some probability that the action they copied from the previous generation uh, is no longer optimal in their generation. Okay, and so this is sloping down because the larger the proportion of other traditionalists who are also copying, uh, the more likely that it is that they're gonna copy somebody who from the previous generation that doesn't have the right action, okay? And so in, in the model under very general conditions, I think this is a super important lesson for economists, 
is there is some amount of culture, some amount of cultural learning, some proportion of traditionalists in the economy, so that not everyone in the society is rational or is homo economicus, okay? And that's basically you know, a, a very important lesson for economists. And I think it dovetails nicely with uh, the work in behavioral economics and outside uh, experimental uh, economics that's been done in the last decade. So I won't talk about this. We could talk a lot about this. Uh, Joe Henrik has done a lot of work about cross um, co cross cultural comparisons using experiments, and others have as well. Uh, but I think that's an important point. In equilibrium, under very general conditions, you get some reliance on culture. So what I'm going to focus on here is the fact that you can have then persistence and mismatch. So what is what this is showing here is you have a society which is in one state, everyone's engaged in a certain action. So imagine we're in state capital A, everyone's engaging in action small a. But now there's a shock which changes the state of the world. And that happens in generation zero, right? Or after generation zero. And what this is showing you is just simulations showing you the proportion of the population that adopts the new action. Okay, and the path that's taken basically depends on the proportion of traditionalists that are in the economy. So if the proportion of traditionalists, for example, here with the solid line is quite low, the transition is going to be quite quick. If the proportion of traditionalists is higher, then the transition is going to be slower. Okay, so while culture is an effective means of adopting the right action and it's cost saving you don't have to reinvent the wheel it does lead to this mismatch okay and why this is persistent so this basically the prior action or the prior environment continues to have an influence on the actions of generations even six seven eight nine generations later okay and so that's conceptually the persistence and then the mismatch is these populations here even after many generations aren't choosing the optimal action for their state, right, or for their environment. Okay, so this is all I think reviewed everyone. Um, of course, there's the famous biological or evolutionary examples, the, the sea turtles that head towards light, and this is an effective shortcut means of uh, them returning to the ocean after they hatch. But in today's environment where there are street lights and freeways, um, this is uh, not necessarily the optimal, optimal heuristic, okay? So the question is, does this insight apply to our world and is it important? So I'm gonna give you one example from the world that I know and uh, a number of empirical examples. So this is, has to do with international health policy. So over the past um, probably 20, 30, well, 60 years have been huge advances in uh, medical technology. And over the past 20 or 30 years, advances in getting things like vaccination, polio vaccination as an example, out to the world, right? And so there's been a lot of money raised, um, huge mobilization efforts uh, put in by doctors and others, NGOs to provide healthcare to the poorest countries in the world. Okay, so then what you have though, this it's almost like a last mile problem. You engage in this huge amount of work and then people are refusing uh, these healthcare interventions, these vaccines, for example. Okay, um, so there's, there's a well-known example in 2003 about polio vaccines being rejected by a number of states in Nigeria, for example. Um, and more recently with Ebola, there's actually a number of cases in the Congo where I work of um, individuals rejecting um, treatment and actually you know, uh, um, uh, there are a number of healthcare workers that were actually killed uh, because of this, right? So, so this is a, an issue and you might think, well, why is this the case? So there's a tendency, I think, for, I speak for economists to say, oh, well, for some reason, these people are, aren't rational uh, or they just don't know and they don't know what's good for them. If we go back in time, and this is research done by uh, my two students, and say, well, where might these fears come from? Uh, if you look at the history of uh, colonialism on the continent, what you find is, well, now is not the period in time in which we first had medical campaigns, in which we first had interventions where the West tried to improve things for, um, for developing countries. 
So there are, they focus on French colonial medical campaigns. And the goal here was to eradicate sleeping sickness, so trypanosomiasis. And it was done kind of in a brute force way. So you could see from their point of view, they were trying to be efficient, but villagers were required often at gunpoint to submit to physical exams. Um, basically to test the most effective way to test for uh, trypanosomiasis was um, a spinal tap, which is shown in this picture here. And early treatment was a drug called atoxyl. And it turned out ex post, so this would have been in the 1920s, 30s, ex post, it wasn't a great drug. It caused, caused blindness uh, in 20% of those individuals that were treated, right? Uh, and there's, there's a memory of this. Uh, there's songs and stories that are passed down from generation to generation. So they basically uh, wanted to understand, is this a source of uh, hesitation or distrust in Western medicine today? So they went to the archives in France and collected information on the times visited of uh, this region in French equatorial Africa. Okay, so this is... Um, <clears throat> And so th this shows the intensity of the times, times visited here. Okay, so this is Chad, Cameroon, Gabon, uh, Congo, just to give you a sense of where this is. And if you correlate this to uh, vaccination rates today, or individuals that's on the left, individuals refusing blood tests. So a number of organizations are giving free blood tests to test for low, uh, for anemia or HIV. And these are often refused. Uh, you see that refusals are positively associated with these historical uh, visits, campaign visits, and vaccination rates are negatively correlated, okay? So not only that, but actually, if you look at the success of health projects, right? Uh, so the World Bank ranks their health projects on a one to five scale. If you look at the success of the health projects, um, basically in places that had been visited a lot by these colonial medical campaigns, uh, those health projects are less successful, okay? So this kind of feeds into actually the efficacy of foreign aid and everything the World Bank and other organizations are trying to do. If you look at other projects like road building, um, school construction, et cetera, you don't see that negative relationship. And in fact, you see a positive relationship between the two, okay? Okay. So closer to home, we can think of the current pandemic. So this, these are COVID vaccination rates. And this is from, uh, I guess, March 1st until uh, September 20th. And it's just how the rates vary within the United States by race, okay? And so one thing that's well known is the vaccination rates are particularly low amongst uh, black individuals within the United States, okay? So you might think about, well, why is this? And another student of mine, Marcel Alsan, basically uh, about you know, three, four or five years ago, uh, wanted to understand this issue. And it's well known actually, uh, and that the mortality rate of African-American men relative to white men is much, much higher, okay? So if you look at this back in time, you can get some insight into this. This is 1968, the mortality uh, rate of black men versus white men. So there was a gap, right? So it's higher amongst black men, but it's coming down over time. And it's coming down for women as well over time until 1972. And then you see there's this divergence. So the pattern for men is very different. The gap no longer is declining and starts to increase, whereas the pattern for women continues to decline, okay? So what happened in 1972? Well, this is actually when um, the reports of the Tuskegee experiment came out, right? So it was actually July 25th, 1972 uh, in Ramparts Magazine and the New York Times Associated Press. And what this was, was an experiment where men, so men only, were left untreated for syphilis. It ran over 40 years. Um, and they were allowed to die so that the government could understand the life course of syphilis and what it did to individuals, right? And their bodies were autopsied. So Marcy in this paper basically looks at men versus women, uh, black men versus white men, and also distance from uh, Tuskegee, Alabama, 
and looked at the effects that this had on mortality rates and found that it basically led to higher mortality rates under uh, to for African American men. Okay, and it's simple things like in their 50s and 60s not going for regular checkups and not getting heart medication or simple things that would uh, reduce their mortality rates. Okay. So why, why is this important? So this has actually been recognized and, uh, and linked to the current vaccine hesitancy, right? So it's an example of plausibly, arguably example of mismatch where this historical event still has effects today, right? And their effects or they cause behaviors which might be suboptimal, okay? So there's actually a number of individuals who are descendants of the Tuskegee study and they put together videos, held conferences, basically to try and inform individuals um, and break the link between the history of Tuskegee and uh, COVID vaccine hesitancy today. Okay, so there's one um, misunderstanding which is in the popular narrative about Tuskegee, and that's that the individuals were injected with syphilis. Right, so you can see how that links to vaccines today being injected with something and you need to trust the government. So part of this was to break that social memory and to um, inform people that it wasn't an injection of syphilis, but actually it was withholding medicine, right? So it was actually what the lesson we should learn today is that we should demand access to the vaccine as well, that we wanna make sure we're not withheld medicine as the black community. So, so that's one uh, way of understanding vaccine hesitancy today. And it's in some sense, recognizing mismatch and trying to tackle it. Um, another strategy or another view, which is very different, and this is an NPR article, is actually saying it's not mismatch, right? So there is a distrust of Western, uh, or sorry, of, of medicine today. Uh, there are higher mortality rates and, but, and what this is saying is um, in this in this article is well because there is still currently bias and racism within medicine, right? So it's not mismatch. Our actions to distrust medicine, to not go to the doctor, to be hesitant are optimal given the current environment, right? That's a very different view, uh, and there's very different policy implications um, uh, in either case, and it really boils down to is this a case of mismatch or not, right? Okay, so I'm going to turn to a few a few other examples uh, and some work that I've worked on, and just to show you that mismatch is real and it has a first order effect on global poverty. Okay, so one of the largest determinants of economic growth and prosperity is a, a, we could call a cultural trait of interpersonal trust. Okay, so in order to engage in business to undertake any complex production, you need to have some amount of trust. Suppliers and buyers need to trust one another. Uh, you have to be, be certain about the quality. And you see this in the cross-country data. So this is generalized trust on average for each country. So just the fraction of people who report they can trust others on average. And then the, the natural log of income per capita. Okay. So if you look here, you can see all of your favorite countries, the USA, Germany, Austria. But if you stare at it for long enough, you notice one thing. Down here, what you have, these are almost all exclusively African countries, Rwanda, Uganda, Ken Kenya, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Malawi, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So what do they have? They have the lowest levels of trust and the lowest levels of income per capita, right? So, you know, why is that? One view is, well, because they're poor, people don't trust each other. Um, I think another view is, well, there's something about their history of the evolution of the society that's causing trust to be particularly low and therefore income per capita is low, okay? So work I've done is on the slave trade. This is an, a, uh, an event historically that was unique to the African continent. Um, over a period of 400, 500 years, uh, 20, 30, 40 million individuals were taken from the continent. It's not known with certainty. Many, many more were had their lives disrupted because of the slave trade, okay? And one thing about the slave trade, which I think made it particularly detrimental, is it wasn't Europeans coming and enslaving Africans. It wasn't an outsider coming in enslaving uh, the local population. 
Okay. Instead, it was the local population, which was enslaving others or groups within the continent enslaving others. So these are data actually that uh, I collected from records uh, from a linguist named, named Sigismund Kelle, uh, who was interested in the languages of these groups. And these were individuals that were brought to Freetown, Sierra Leone. And in his interviews with them, he asked, by the way, how did you get here? And I just coded these up. You can see the vast majority were kidnapped or seized. A lot of this would have been local, so that people within your community or neighboring communities would have kidnapped or seized you or your kids. But this is what's really striking is 20% were sold or tricked by a relative or friend. So this is someone very close to you. You got in an argument or you had a dispute and then they arranged for you to be sold into slavery and they kept the proceeds, right? And the judicial process would have been through local, local means as, as well. So these are like things like accusations of witchcraft or adultery or things like this. Okay, so Basically, in the study, I teamed up with um, somebody from Southern Benin who kind of intuitively felt that this was the case, that this history of slaving over this 400 year period would have generated norms of distrust. Okay, and that period is over, right? But the, there's persistence in the effects of that shock, that historical shock, and they continue to affect uh, cultural traits and economic outcomes today. So to test this, we collected shipping records so we know the ports of embarkation, disembarkation for about 35,000 voyages in the transatlantic slave trade. Turns out there are three other slave trades that hit the continent. So we collect data on those as well. Uh, so that gives us some information on where slaves came from, were shipped from, but we don't know where they originally came from, enslaved individuals. And so we also collected data on the ethnicity, the known ethnic group groups of enslaved individuals. And for example, there was 81,000 individuals from the transatlantic slave trade. So between these two sources of data, you can construct estimates of how many people were taken from each ethnic group within Africa during these slave trades, okay? And so after a bunch of work, this is, uh, you do have estimates. There are our best guesses. And this is just a, a map that shows you the variation here. So this is from the transatlantic slave trade where slaves would have been shipped to the Americas. And you see, uh, this is kind of consistent with the known history. And I'll show you also the Indian Ocean slave trade where the slaves were shipped to the Middle East and to Mauritius and Reunion. Um, and you can see that there's more from the Eastern coast, obviously, okay. So then what we do is link this to individuals. We have data on 20,000 individuals and the survey data and the individuals are asked in general, how much do you trust other people? So they're asked, how much do you trust people from other ethnic groups, from your own ethnic group, from how much do you trust your neighbors, and how much do you trust your relatives? And I believe it's on a uh, zero to four scale. And what you find consistently, so these are called bin scatter plots. So the data have been aggregated, so you can see it. If you had 20,000 points, you would, really wouldn't be able to see it. So these are aggregated bins. You see a consistent negative relationship, right? So locations that had more individuals that were enslaved, in other words, the slave trade hit those locations. So that would have been these locations here. Those individuals exhibit lower levels of trust today. And one thing that really surprised us is, well, at first, till we uh, understood the history more, is this had a particularly large impact on trust of relatives, right? Trust of those closest to you. But after reading these, um, uh, accounts, uh, firsthand accounts of the slave trade and how prevalent it was for friends and families to turn on one another, um, then this wasn't surprising, okay? So again, this, this, this is an example of where an event that's over continues to matter today. Uh, and I think matters in ways that are, are first order, super important for economic development, okay? So another example is female employment. Okay, so these are probably, like I said, the two largest things uh, that affect per capita income today. So if half your population is not employed, this is just mechanically gonna have a detrimental impact on per capita income. And you can see there's huge amount of variation in the extent to which women work in the, in the labor force, okay? So it's well below 20% in some societies uh, and then upwards of 70, 80% in others. And if you look at the societies with the lowest and the highest rates of female labor force participation, they're both uh, relatively poor developing societies, 
right? Both groups. And so it's not just, oh, income induces women to work, uh, but there seems to be something else going on. So with Alberto Alazina, we, we studied uh, one hypothesis, which had been put out there by Esther Bozerup. And this is basically that the roots of modern day gender norms lie in traditional agricultural practices. Okay. And so this is showing two forms of agriculture. On the left is plow agriculture, uh, which is more intensive, uses an animal and uses this implement, the plow. Um, and this requires a lot of upper body strength. So you have to control the animal, you have to push the plow continuously through the soil. Um, and so this tends to be done by men historically. On the right is Swidden or slash and burn agriculture, which uses a hoe. And it's, um, it's also a lot of work, but doesn't require the same amount of strength. You can see that smaller amounts of soil are overturned or moved uh, than with the plow. And you can also see that it's more compatible with childcare, right? And so historically, uh, hoe agriculture tended to be uh, undertaken just as much by women as men. So with um, plow agriculture, there was a gender division of labor where women specialized in work within the home, men outside the home. And with hoe agriculture, that didn't, that wasn't the case. Okay. And the idea here is, while well, these traditional agricultural practices generated these norms or these um, values, and these persist today, even though countries in general are, in, are primarily not engaged in agriculture. So there's not a direct effect today, but through these norms, these effects persist, right? So again, an example of mismatch to the extent that having a norm where women um, are less capable of working outside the home is detrimental to economic growth. Okay, so to test this, basically, we collected information uh, from or used information from the ethnographic atlas on the extent to which a thousand plus ethnic groups around the world traditionally used plow, ag plow agriculture. And then we linked that to fine grain data, which is shown here on what languages are spoke, spoken around the world. And so this is just an example from Ethiopia, where we have different languages, they're linked to the ethnographic data, and then we know different locations around the within Ethiopia, uh, did their ancestors use the plow or not? Okay, so in this case, in the highlands of Ethiopia, uh, a plow was traditionally used where teff was grown, uh, and in the lowlands, uh, hoe agriculture tended to be used. Okay, so then you can calculate ancestral, so the extent to which populations today in different parts of the world um, had ancestors which engaged in plow agriculture. Okay, so remember this is done through language. So uh, in the US, we would use English, and then the, the question is, did the English traditionally use plow agriculture? Uh, and so you see, uh, you see that in general, they, they did, right? And here it would be Portuguese plus some indigenous languages. Okay, so what do we find? We undertake analysis at many levels. So it's, um, uh, I won't drag you through all of it, but countries, districts within countries, even ethnic groups within districts, and even look at immigrants that come to the United States. And you find consistently that plow agriculture, a history of plow agriculture is associated with less female labor force participation. But not only that, and this is a link to institutions, but actually less representation of women in government, less entrepreneurship by women, less female firm ownership. And in a subsequent paper we looked at, so I'll, I'll show you these, these are um, partial correlation plots. So controlling for a whole host of things like income, education levels, et cetera, you see negative relationships with female air force participation, firm ownership and women in politics. So not only that in a subsequent paper, we actually looked at the sex ratio, right? So we thought, well, maybe this affects how girls are valued relative to boys. And you do see differences in sex ratio at birth. So this is showing averages for countries with plow agriculture and countries without plow agriculture. And so uh, countries without plow agriculture have a more equal sex ratio, less bias towards uh, men. And, you, and this is at birth and then for older cohorts. And you can see that the difference just uh, diverges. So a lot of this is because of differential mortality due to access to health and food uh, as, as children grow up, right? Uh, but you do see it even uh, in the sex ratio at birth. 
Okay. So again, if we think that treating half of our population less equally, so women than men, uh, is detrimental for not only their health and well-being, but for economic growth, and uh, this is this is an example of mismatch. Okay. Okay, uh, another example from a very recent working paper is um, with a number of co-authors, we looked at the um, well-known culture of honor hypothesis. So from the, you know, uh, summarizing the great book by Richard Nisbet and Dove Cohen, and we kind of wanted to push this a step further and ask, well, is the culture of honor um, an important determinant of the prevalence of violence in civil war today? Okay, and in particular, the culture of honor rooted in a tradition of herding, right? So the, the argument being, or the idea being, in societies, particularly societies that didn't have a strong state, um, if you were, had herds, which could be easily be stolen, you needed to develop a culture of honor in order to protect your herds, okay? And so we, under, we basically show a number of things. One is if you just look historically in the ethnographic data, uh, societies that had herding, basically have folk tales which uh, emphasize um, revenge, taking, um, and violence. Okay? Uh, in those societies also, violence is more acceptable. And if you look at today, basically, if you look at, uh, there's from the Global Preferences Survey, so this is a survey undertaken around the world with thousands of individuals, that uh, norms of punishment uh, and reciprocity are stronger for individuals whose ancestors engaged in herding. And the other thing we find is civil war is more prevalent in those societies as well, okay? So this historical factor um, is important or what for explaining the prevalence of civil war around the world today, okay? And again, to the extent that uh, traditional herding no longer exists, um, but it's still leaving its imprint and it's inducing behavior, uh, which is suboptimal, then it's example of mismatch, okay? Okay, so I won't go on. I could go on about many, many more examples. And I think these are kind of important insights within economics. And just in the past 10 or 20 years, we're understanding that events, even if they happened hundreds of years ago and they're over, can still be shaping economic outcomes or social outcomes today. Okay, so this is for my, my discipline, a, a lesson. I'm sure uh, for many of you, this has been known for a while. Um, so, so that's important. And one thing I want to focus on now is, well, an, an important thing to understand, or it would be nice to understand, is when should we expect mismatch to be particularly strong, right? Uh, so that helps for policy and looking forward. Um, and the proximate answer is, well, it's when culture is really important or tradition is really uh, is viewed as being really important. And so if we just go back to the Rogers model, um, we can say, well, what happens when delta changes? Okay, so this is the historical stability, instability of the environment. So if we have, uh, look at delta prime, so this is the environment in one society is uh, more unstable. Uh, that's basically gonna shift this curve, which is the payoff function of the traditionalists down, right? So the intercept here is beta one minus delta, delta prime is greater than delta. And the proportion of traditionalists in the society is gonna be lower, okay? So with more instability, culture is less strong, basically. And that makes sense because culture works because of vertical transmission. You can cop, uh, rely on uh, the values which have been developed up to the previous generation. But if the environment, my generation is gonna be quite different, those values are not gonna be appropriate, okay? And then if we return to this, uh, we see that, well, delta, right? This is the case here, uh, the solid line where there's a lot of instability so that uh, the equilibrium amount of culture is low. And so you're not gonna have as much of mismatch as environments where Delta is low, okay? Where there's a lot of uh, stability. So then the equilibrium amount of culture is high or the proportion of traditionalists is high. And then basically change occurs slowly. So you're more likely to have mismatch, okay? Okay, so basically what this is telling you is if we take this model seriously or literally, maybe not li literally, but seriously, is well, the stability of the environment of my ancestors 
is going to affect the extent to which I observe mis mismatch today in different societies. Okay, so I guess uh, with Paolo Giuliano, we were maybe foolishly enough to go down this road and say, well, let's let's actually test this in the data. Right, this is kind of um, a non-obvious prediction, and if we really believe models like this, and many models have this prediction where the stability of the environment affects the prevalence of culture, uh, maybe we'll see it in the data. So what we did was take paleoclimatic data. So these are estimates from Charles Mann, uh, from a whole host of things, tree rings, ice cores, etc., from 500 AD up until we stop in 1990 or in 1900, sorry. Uh, and we have measures in this case of temperature uh, uh, instability or, or, or uh, deviations in temperature from a long run trend, okay? And here I intentionally picked two locations, one with more stability and one with less stability, okay? And the first thing we do is take this these annual data and convert them to generational data. So these are, uh, basically averages over a 20 year period. So remember, in if we take the model seriously, what matters is how much one generation differs from another, not how much things change within my lifetime. Okay, so conceptually, we thought that's the right thing to do. And you can see here that across generations, uh, temperature is pretty similar, right, right up until the end. Um, and so that's Central Africa. In this case, this is actually where Stockholm is. The grid cell that has Stockholm, there's a lot more variability, okay? And if we take the generational averages, you can see that one generation could have an environment that's very different from another, okay? And so then what we do is just calculate the standard deviation, right? So how much variability is there for each of these different locations across these generations? And that gives us a measure of ancestral instability of the environment. So literally, you know, or close to uh, conceptually what we think of as delta in the model. Okay. And when we do this, this is at the grid cell level, basically measures of instability. So a darker shade means more instability. So I was showing you Stockholm up here and then uh, a cell down here from Central Africa. Okay. And so, uh, so that's kind of the variation you can think of. Okay, so what, what this is telling you is if my ancestors lived in one of these grid cells in which there is a lot of instability, then culture or tradition is not going to be very important and we're not going to have much mismatch today, right? Because uh, actions will change, respond to the environment pretty quickly, right? Okay, so let's see if that's the case. Um, so to do that, because a lot of data is at the country level, we need to match um, this to countries. So again, we do something similar to our uh, previous paper where we know the location of ethnic groups traditionally. So this is about 1300, 1400 ethnic groups. So we know their uh, pre-industrial location. We can link that to grid cells. And then we can link that to languages today. And so here's just a map of all the languages around the world, about 8,000 languages and dialects today. And through that process, we can then calculate measures of ancestral climatic instability across countries today. Okay, so this is how much did uh, temperature vary from generation to generation uh, amongst the ancestors of people who lived in France or people who lived in Brazil. Okay, remember it's the same thing where a lot of the ancestors of people living in Brazil would have been from Portugal. Right, so that's being linked to a grid cell in Portugal, right? Not all of them, because there's also indigenous uh, language or indigenous populations. Okay, so if we do just the very first thing is there are, there is information on how important tradition is to people. This is in the World Values Survey. And so this is just showing you the data at the country level. So this is the relationship between historical climatic instability and the importance of tradition uh, as reported in these surveys. So you can see that where the environment was more unstable, right? So more variability, people report it's less important to adhere or to pass on the traditions of your ancestors, right? It's, it's less important to adhere to traditions, okay? So you think of that as mapping or testing the prediction of delta to X star in the Rogers model, okay? And so the, ne the next thing we look at is immigration. And so, Ideally to do this, you have a natural experiment. So think of this figure here, you have everyone's engaged in one action and then the environment changes, 
right? And it's known or it's clear that we should all be engaged in a different action, okay? So how do we get a natural experiment where we have a setting like this? So immigration to the United States is, is one such experiment. So this, the environment literally changes for these immigrants. They come to the US uh, and there's certain things now that they're gonna have to change, certain traditions, right? And so one is language, right? So if you're from Italy, you traditionally spoke Italian, but now uh, there's these uh, um, pressures to speak English. Do you continue to speak Italian? Uh, prior, you married within your group. Do you continue to marry within your group, even though the environment has changed, right? And conceptually, what we do here is look at people who were born and raised in the same city, so Dallas, Texas, uh, so, but their parents immigrated from different countries. So we're literally holding the environment constant, the new environment, and just trying to measure this uh, speed of convergence, the differences between these lines conceptually. Okay, so I'm just going to show you raw data. This is a sample of married women whose parents were born in another country. And you ask, is the husband from the same country of origin? And then we've, we've just aggregated all these individuals up to the country level to visualize this. Okay, so what you find is if these individuals have parents who are from a country with more instability, they're less likely to marry the husband from the same country of origin. Okay, so they're less likely to hold on to that tradition. So if the climate was the ancestral climate is quite stable, they're more likely to hold on to that tradition. Okay, so there's more, um, you could think of it as mismatch or more cultural persistence, right? And each of these dots are going to have a different number of individuals in them. So these circles are just showing you the number of individuals that are from each of these countries because they're not all equally important. So this is Mexico, for example. Okay. So either way, though, if you look at the data, you do see um, you do see a negative relationship. So if we do the same thing for language, right? Uh, we see the exact same pattern. If you are from uh, a background or ha have ancestors that were in an environment that's more stable, you're more likely to switch or stop speaking your traditional language at home. Okay. So the, the one of the last things I'm going to show you, and then I'll end, is um, you might be worried about immigrants because they're a select sample. So those that migrate are already more open to new environments. So we also look at indigenous populations of North America. So they are facing a new environment, but it's not their choice to face this new environment, okay? So they don't have the same selection pressures, but it's very similar in the sense of, we can ask the question, do they continue to speak their indigenous language or know how to speak their indigenous language? It's actually independently of interest because they're kind of, you know, weekly or monthly, there are indigenous languages which are dying out. Um, and so why in certain cases do languages die out in other cases? people continue to speak those languages. So if you do the same exercise, we know where different um, indigenous groups uh, were located historically, link that to the climatic data. And again, looking at the same lo locations, but people from different backgrounds, we see where the climate was more unstable, right? Um, so tradition is less important, that people are less likely to speak their indigenous language at home, okay? So the very last thing you can do, it's not as clean, but just look at the date, the world around us, right? And just look over time and look at natural variation and see, is it the case that in some countries things are changing and other countries things aren't? So we look at three characteristics that have been changing in general in the world. So female employment, women in general are entering the labor force, cousin marriage, which is dying out and polygyny, which is dying out. But are these things changing at the same speed, right? And what you find is basically a history that our ancestral instability of the climate affects the speed at which these are changing, okay? And so just to show, I'll show you this with one example. This is basically looking at how persistent female labor force participation is across each year between 1960 and 2018 right? And graphing that against climatic instability. So this is the coefficient of persistence. And you find it's more persistent in the places that historically had a more stable climate. So that tradition would have been stronger uh, because there's a greater reliance on cultural transmission. Okay. So again, this lines up uh, exactly with what we'd expect. Okay. Or what we'd think.
Okay, so I'll just conclude and I'm happy to take a number of number of questions. Um, so I reviewed a recent body of research within economics. So part of what I want to do is, is, is give you a sense of what's been going on in economics, how economics is starting to use uh, an understanding of cultural evolution, and to give you a sense that these are actually important for economic phenomena, right? So um, that economists should be interested in this and things like poverty, global health, global well-being, gender norms are um, affected, affected by this. So as I argued, I think mismatch really helps us to understand a host of contemporary issues. And um, we also looked at, well, when do we expect mis mismatch to be particularly severe? Okay, so we tested that prediction uh, uh, from the Rogers model. I think it's nice, a nice prediction about the evolutionary framework in general, because it's a testable prediction. It's, it's not the most obvious ex ante. Um, and uh, and the model, in some sense, passes with flying colors, right? And so it seems to be a, a, a framework that's consistent with, with the data. And I think moving forward, there's a lot more that can be understood uh, and a lot of insight that mismatch can provide. I just want to give you one example here and just food for thought because it's not proven or anything. But uh, there's a recent study by my colleague Alberto Alizina and co-authors, which looked at uh, perceptions about mobility. And one thing that you find here and this is actual mobility and perceived mobility, and they have a small number of countries, the US is off the charts in terms of its perceived mobility. It views mobility, the ability to move up the socioeconomic ladder, much higher than it really is, right? And you can see these ones are kind of, you know, they're actually pessimistic on that side of the line. The US is much, much more optimistic. And if you look at other questions, the US is an outlier in the extent to which you believe the American dreams alive and well, that if people are poor, it's because they're not trying hard enough. And because of that, the government shouldn't be involved, right? So why is the US so exceptional? Well, if you look at the historical data and look at census data, uh, mobility in the US in the 19th century in the 1800s was higher than anywhere else in the world, essentially, at least higher than Britain, higher than anywhere in Europe. So one way to think of this is th these perceptions were formed hundreds of years ago, they persist, right? And they're actually wrong today. <laughs> they're, they're incorrect. I think that's clearly shown here. And that feeds into institutions, policies, views about the government, uh, you know, the, the role of government, whether we should have a welfare state, etc. Okay, so that's just a conjecture. But I think um, just to show you that I think understanding the evolution of these views uh, goes a long way in understanding uh, things that are of first order importance in the world, right? Okay, so I'll pause there and happy to uh, ask, have questions and other things. Fantastic, thank you so much, Nathan. Maybe um, if people can switch on their microphones for a quick round of applause for such a great talk. <laughs> thank you. People switch on the microphones. Maybe not, okay, maybe technical problems. Uh, I'm sure everybody appreciated it though. Uh, Okay, so uh, just a reminder to everybody um, that we're going to take questions only through the question and answer uh, section. So if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the question and answer section so that I can, uh, I can read them. So there's no hands up. And if you put it in the chat, I will not be asking it. Um, okay, so I'm going to go first to the questions that have been posted. And the first one uh, is from uh, Burton Vuhiers, who asks, um, a mismatch uh, I've long, uh, long found fascinating is from ancient Greece, where the cultural texts of Homer were celebrating the much earlier Mycenaean warrior palace-centered culture, while the fifth century BC culture was city-centered. Have you looked at these kind of historical examples or things like the independent cowboy myth uh, in urban America today? I guess your last slides were kind of touching a little bit on that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I definitely haven't looked at it. I think this is a line of research which would be very fruitful. Um, it, like another example would be, which is related to the cowboy myth, is gun ownership, 
in the United States today. So why is it that the US has certain views about gun ownership? There have been some hypotheses which have been put out by um, sociologists where it has to do with the settlement of the frontier of, of the United States and the importance of combat or conflict with indigenous populations and how the government promoted that and even required people to own guns. And therefore it was, you know, your right and your requirement. Um, so that's another example. I, I definitely haven't looked at ancient Greece. Um, but one thing I've, I've, I have wrote a, a summary piece, the title was History is Evolution. And what I think is important in, in this question basically is, is highlighting or touching on is the importance to view history or to undertake historical analysis, including by historians, with an evolutionary perspective, right? Connecting different time periods, looking at the big picture, uh, thinking about the long run dynamics of, of things. And, you know, there are people that who are not historians doing this for sure. Peter Turchin, for example, who's doing this empirically, jo Joseph Henrik. Um, but I think it would be extremely fruitful for uh, historians to, uh, you know, at least, or a subset of them to have, have, have this kind of evolutionary perspective. So, yeah, so I very much agree with the, mm -hmm. the tone of the question. And yeah. yeah. So just a kind of a follow up to that point. Um, so in that example you talked about with the American uh, over optimism uh, or you know mm -hmm. the, the belief in the American dream so yeah presumably at some point that was um, that seemed to have been a kind of a, a relevant or kind of you know that was grounded in reality and mm -hmm. then as yeah. time has gone on that has become less uh, less truthful so um, do you have any kind of insight or intuitions about why certain traits or some personality things get fixed like that so why don't why aren't people responding yeah. uh, you know more adaptively to to the current circumstances yeah yeah it's, you know so the one thing in the talk was the delta the ancestral stability of the environment and so you know i won't talk about that again but the other thing which i didn't talk about was kappa actually right so you have something similar where kappa which was the horizontal line if that changes which is the cost of um, being rational and acquiring information or the difficulty of being rational and, and acquiring information and figuring out what's optimal, uh, that that basically also affects the prevalence of tradition, right? So, so basically what this is telling you, things that are really hard to learn about, um, that you should see culture playing a more important role. Right. So things like if you, we talked about vaccination hesitancy, so science, uh, medicine, these are things that are hard for us to understand. Uh, the afterlife, uh, the, all these sorts of things. So more complex things we should see actually a stronger reliance on tradition. Um, and then also more mismatch or more persistence. Right. Religion is, would be another example. Right. Things that are simple to figure out. We, we yeah, we can. And so something like mobility and how we should structure government. That's a pretty complex issue. And so you can see why that might these norms might persist. And in U.S. politics today, people rely on emotion <laughs> rather than uh, logical thinking and trying to rational, yeah, rationally think things through. And I think uh, for many people that might be the case, right? And so, so this is, I think, providing exactly um, uh, a way of thinking about about these things. Yeah. Fantastic. Good. Uh, next question uh, from Chris von Ruden. Um, do you think natural selection over the past few hundred or thousands of years has been operating on conformity uh, differently in different populations, giving different rates of change in environmental variability? Um, or are you principally positing operation uh, of kind of a kind of a universal uh, Pan, uh, pan human facultative psychology that tailors conformism to environmental variability? Um, so, yeah, so I don't have a lot to say on the natural selection versus uh, cultural, cultural transmission. Um, even in the case of the slave trade, it's possible that what you're finding is because of some form of natural selection. I don't think it's as plausible. And so that would be that the more trusting people were enslaved and then shipped from the continent so that the resulting population are individuals who were not enslaved and they were the more, more distrustful. Um, but I think, um, yeah, so I don't have a lot to say on that. Pete would probably have more to say on, <laughs> on natural selection versus, yeah, cultural evolution. Um, but, um, and then conformity, I don't know if conformity is being 
you know, increasing or decreasing. Um, there's some recent work by Michelle Gelfand and then also my student, Max Winkler, which is looking at uh, norm tightness and how basically shocks affect uh, norm tightness and cause, caused, cause increased uh, tightness of norms. And, uh, and so the body of work by Michelle uh, and my student, Max, seem to indicate that that's the case. Like times of crisis cause, you can think of it as conformity, uh, tighter norms and so. Um, yeah, but it's not something I've looked at specifically. And I don't know if there's a long run trend, actually. I don't know any, of any thoughts or evidence on that I've read. So maybe I'll just say a couple of our panelists have their hands up. Do, um, do either of you guys have questions along, along similar, similar points? Pete and Monique. Uh, Monique saying no. Uh, another question. So, uh, Pete, have you got one? My question. My question comes from the your answer to the first question from the uh, uh, audience, and uh, there's this idea that uh, I attribute to Karl Marx that uh, that institutional change is relatively slow for the reasons that you uh, mentioned, and that uh, technological change is is much easier. It's it's the adoption of cell phones is. Uh, 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 ripped through the world population in a, in a decade or two. Uh, the uh, uh, response to economic inequality is creeping along, you might, uh, you might think. Uh, uh, so uh, do you know if there's any solid data, that uh, uh, solid information that, that uh, bears out that uh, uh, Marxian pattern? It recurs, people have reinvented it. It's not just Marx. Uh, well, uh, lots of people have that view, and it seems intuitively uh, completely plausible. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I think if you were to look at the data, there there is data uh, on innovation uh, that economists have put together. So a guy named Diego Komen on innovations historically. I think back to uh, you know 1000 BC or something, uh, and you you do see a lot of change the relative ranking of societies and how um, innovative or uh, how much technology they have stays re relatively constant, but there is a lot, of, a lot of change. And I would think it's hard to know how you quantify institutions, but uh, we do see uh, institutions not you know, innovating or changing in the same way. So I think that's definitely, definitely the case. Yeah, and so, um, and I think it's easy to think about why that would be the case. So one is that institutions are the outgrowth of uh, basically cultural values and beliefs, right? And so if those are changing, the underlying, what we think is uh, uh, the, the role of government or what the ideal society looks like or how much inequality is okay, then the institutions aren't gonna, aren't gonna change as well. And then, um, and then the other thing about institutions, you think about policy is there is path dependence. So we can add another bill, but we're stuck with the full history <laughs> of uh, policies and the kind of institutional innovations. And so this le leads to this kind of, yeah, these situations where you're kind of locked in and maybe converge to a, a local optima instead of a global optima. And so, yeah, so I think there's lots of reasons to think that uh, theoretically that uh, what you said, the institutional change is gonna be slow, yeah. <clears throat> Cool. I'll just go to the, the Q&A and then come to Monique after that. So um, another question about uh, kind of the timeframes of this. So a um, question from Charles Wan is, does mismatch depend on your time horizon? Um, what might be a mismatch on the short term horizon, given some large exogenous shock might actually be adaptive um, on a longer time horizon? Um, and I'll also add in to that um, a question around um, this idea of what, if you've got one thing, where you might see a potential mismatch. Um, that might be a potential mismatch, but the, the whole behavior might be more adaptive in a wider sense in that in one situation, something so getting vaccines might be um, uh, a mismatch, but other behaviors uh, might be uh, more generally adaptive. Yeah. So. Okay, so those are two, two great questions. <clears throat> on the shorter time horizon, this is something I'm thinking of, and I don't know quite how to think of it, so I'll just throw it out there. You know, so there is evidence um, that events that happen early in one's life, so we're thinking now within generations, not across generations, right, that events that happen early in one's life uh, then affect 
their cultural traits in adulthood. Um, and so there's been some work by an economist, David Yannicka Zawadrat, which has looked within the United States and looks at whether you attend 4th of July festivities. So uh, do you attend the parades, the fireworks, the uh, barbecues? And, and he basically finds if you do this as a child, and you can estimate what's the effect in different ages of your life. If you do this as a child, then as an adult, you're more patriotic. And as an adult, you're more actually also likely to vote Republican, interestingly enough. Um, and so I don't know if that's mismatch, but it's these shocks, which are now over, right? You're no longer attending those activities, but they kind of stay with you for the rest of your life and form, you know, help to form this heuristic that you rely on. Um, there's been other studies that if you grew up in a recession, so same thing, a recession hits you when you're young, you're more conservative in your financial decisions when you're old. And so, and so that's, those are on much, much shorter time horizons, actually. Uh, and then recent research about similar to the 4th of July protests. So there have been economists which have, have tried to exogenously vary or get natural variation in people going to protests. And that kind of feeds feeds on itself and has kind of persistent effects. So, so I don't know if you think of those as mismatch because maybe that's optimal, uh, but but those definitely have effects and they're over a shorter time horizon. Um, and then behavior. Um, so this is kind of interesting. I don't know if it's exactly what you're asking, but um, there's a sense in which the a historical event could have affected a cultural trait. And then that cultural trait in turn, and this is where kind of in the social science is different than biology, that cultural trait in turn affects the environment. And then it could actually make that trait optimal <laughs> when you otherwise it might not be. So for the example of trust in Africa, the, the story would be, and there's evidence for this, I didn't talk about it, but that um, the slave trade led to distrust right, including distrust in your local government and, and those around you. So because of that distrust, you have less economic op opportunity, you have less economic activity, and then the local institutions are worse. So then those things lead to distrusting behavior, right, so that people then, because of these, the environment, you don't have property rights, you don't have laws that are effective, people act in a more distrustful manner. And therefore, then the trust is optimal right, in that sense, but it's because of, yeah, so the shock is basically affecting the environment endogenously, which is endogenous to the culture. And so one could think of that, and, and, and for lots of the examples that I provided, it's not 100% clear whether it was mismatch, because one could say, oh, it, it, you know, it actually is, is optimal. Uh, so, so another example is with female labor force participation, you have a history of the plow, uh, so then you have less female labor force participation, but then what you do uh, endogenous to that is specialize in activities uh, for production and uh, which are not female friendly. So not textiles, but heavy industry, for example. And then the returns to having half your workforce, uh, you know, or, or sorry, half your population not in the workforce aren't that bad, right? And so the mismatch isn't as severe because the environment responds. To, um, to the cultural trait. And so some argue that that's what's going on with Saudi Arabia because they're specialized in oil uh, and can export that and, and get wealth from that, that the, co the, the, the cost of having um, low female labor force participation rates isn't that high, right? And so, so those would be, yeah, two examples. Thank you. Uh, Monique. Hi. Um, that was a really great talk. And um, strangely, um, your last comments to Tom um, pretty much um, answered my question, but let me try it anyhow, because um, it might help clear things up for other people as well. Um, the studies are, are really fascinating. And, you know, thanks for not dragging us through all of the confounding variables that I know you have in your <laughs> papers. Um, but um, I actually do want to come back to this question of mechanism and how you tease mechanism out. You've just given some really nice examples to Tom, but I was thinking particularly about the slave trade, um, the, the East African one. And so there's that corridor down uh, sort of to Lake, Tangan Lake Tanganyika, which is where all the slaves came from. And it's where you're finding the low levels of trust. I happen to work in that area and it's just renowned as an area which became underpopulated, um, was then kind of you, it was a battleground between the Belgium and the French and the Germans, the English, 
Um, it was used as a labor reserve. Uh, it never got any investment during the colonial period. E even in the post-colonial period, it's kind of seen as the backward part of Tanzania. And so you've got all of those uh, features going on um, that are contributing, I would say, to the very low levels of trust that you see. And I don't want to say your results aren't interesting because these are just, you know, if you put these confounding variables in, the result would disappear. But I'm wondering how you think about the sort of, you know, what is the causal model here? And, and what is the role of what, you know, in the old days would be called confounding variables, but actually are probably the path whereby the effect that you're seeing um, is actually being mediated and, and you know, yeah. without um, telling us to have to look at um, sort of, uh, you know, IVs and things like that. Can you, can you yeah. help me through this a bit? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think that's a great question and is um, um, something we look at in the paper, but I think is more generally an issue with this literature, which you call it cultural economics. And so one way to think of it is with the slave trade, there were two stories or two mechanisms. So one was one, you know, roughly or loosely a vertical transmission, or it could be oblique, but where um, norms of distrust uh, form and then they're transmitted uh, uh, to future generations even after the event is over. But the other is these direct effects. So depopulation and if having, you know, a, a critical mass of people is important for having cities and um, and also um, there are direct effects on the local institutions. So if you think those are worse uh, or are, are, sorry, are different than, yeah, than culture. So they were really corrupted. There were accusations of witchcraft. Chiefs had to sell their, their, um, their own um, citizens into slavery, things like this. And so those are very different. But conceptually, you can partition those two into things that are inside people's brains and then things that are outside there in the world, right? So, um, and what you can do, it's kind of a neat um, shorthand or you, you don't have to take a stance on all those external factors, but what you can do is compare two individuals in the same location today. So all those external factors are held constant, but they come from different backgrounds. So in other words, in this setting, they'd, they'd be from two different ethnic groups. So that's kind of one thing that the, the paper can do is two individuals, they're facing the same external environment. So if it's working through institutions, low population density today, even distrust, like how, how others around them are behaving, then you're holding that constant. And you find even in that case, you can consistently see, or you see in general, that individuals whose ancestors were more enslaved have lower levels of trust, even holding that constant. And, and then the other thing you can do is trace the impacts through place and then trace it through ancestry and see how important are those two things. And, uh, and you can do that because people move around, right? Uh, that's not exogenous, so it's not perfect, but people move around. So then you can estimate for each individual, how impacted were my ancestors by the slave trade and how impacted was my city or the location that I'm in by the slave trade. And you find they're about equally important actually. Uh, so which is kind of consistent I, I, I think, well, consistent with what you were saying, is there are these other things like depopulation, corruption of institutions, um, uh, kingdoms falling, uh, which also were important, right? And so, and I, and I think a few times immigrants popped up in, in the slides, and that's like a trick that's used in this literature is, yeah, to look at people who have moved, so they have different ancestry. And, and so I think that's the, yeah, that's the cleanest way that I know of to, to do that, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Monique. Um, so uh, I, kinda, I guess a related question on the methodology, but the other question relates here to your analyses of climatic instability. So uh, Dhruv Goal has a question about whether regions with high climatic instability may also lead to more and early migration, giving them time to adjust with new traditions. Um, so they're asking specifically whether year of migration uh, was controlled for, um, but maybe you can briefly summarize some of the other um, controls that you've uh, used in those studies to kind of tease apart and you know hammer home the kind of the, the causal uh, hypotheses. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I guess two two dimensions to that question. One is um, year of migration in terms of the immigrants coming to the U.S. or um, or indigenous populations uh, coming into contact with Europeans, uh, you know, there were controls for that. 
Uh, so, so that's one answer. Um, and then there's just to answer your question is a, whole, a host of other controls, like when we're looking at individuals, their level of education, for example. So um, because, and then in, do you marry individuals from your own uh, group? We actually control for, which is super important, the number of individuals from your own group that live in the city that you're in, right? If there's no one around, that's gonna have a mechanical effect. So, so there's a lot of things like that about, um, uh, that, that we do control, control for. Um, but I, I think a kind of an interesting question as well related to this is historically, so now we're not talking about just the immigrants that came to the US, but thinking 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, does climatic instability, and this was the question, uh, affect your proclivity to want to move, right? And you think it might, because if you're not holding on to tradition, then a tradition is you live, you know, in your ancestral village or you live uh, amongst your your own group, um, and so maybe then instability causes more movement. And that's people in and out, right? And so, but that would actually lead to additional instability. So that's kind of I think one of the mechanisms uh, or reasons that the environment matters, right? If the temperature is fluctuating, it's not really going to matter per se. But um, it, if it does affect other other things, and then that feeds into itself through uh, being more open to migration, maybe then that could be that yeah you know, that could definitely be part of the mechanism, right? And so yeah. And so a, a related question here in the Q and A is um, whether monetary instability is similar to climate instability um, impacting cultural stability. Because actually, I would I would think eyeballing. The, the countries that have climatic instability, those are the ones that are probably more stable economically. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, so that's one thing we control for definitely is uh, you know, income per capita. Even you, you saw, you kind of see this pattern of distance from the equator, which is known to be highly correlated with income and, and stability as well. Um, so we control for that and you, and you still see it. Um, but I think there's a, a deeper point, which is interesting. If you think of instability over the past, let's say, 500 years, what that really means is economic growth. We're all at kind of subsistence level, more or less. Uh, yeah, a little bit of difference, but maybe 20, 30 percent differences in income across societies um, around 1500. And then there's been this huge divergence. So. The interesting thing here, it's related to the environment being endogenous to human actions, is could the economic growth have then affected uh, the importance of tradition, right? And you can kind of think of, of how this might generate multiple equilibria. Uh, and then in this paper, I mentioned history of, as evolution or book chapter, I kind of work this out mathematically. Uh, but if you allow innovation to be endogenous to the amount of um, tradition in the society. So we have less traditionalists, more people engaging in trial and error. You have more innovation. Um, then what you can get is multiple equilibria actually. So you have one equilibrium where there's a lot of economic growth. So the environment is not stable. So here the Delta comes from economic growth. Uh, so then there's not many traditionalists. So then there's a lot of trial and error, a lot of tinkering and then more economic growth, right? But then you can have another equilibrium where you don't have much economic growth. Delta is low. That means there's a lot of traditionalists and then not a lot of innovation. So then economic growth is low. And so you get these two, two equilibria. And, and there's been some work. So an economic historian, Joel Mokir, has argued that, well, what was the source of the industrial revolution? Well, it was new generations realizing we don't have to adhere to the rules of the old generations. So this, this was true in science but just in general. And so innovation or tradition weakening. Um, and also you can think of family ties weakening um, as, as well. And so maybe that's true. I think that that needs to be understood. But, uh, but I think you know, the longer run processes, I think is, is, is where economic stability is gonna uh, most likely to have been important, yeah. And presumably that, um... Uh, that you know whether whether you know, doing the same thing as you've done before or whether doing new things will depend on the particular features of the economy, the resource base, and you know how how it, you know how the economy works in those situations, right? So. Yeah, 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 exactly. If it's growing quickly, then it's important to <laughs> change the way <laughs> things are going, and and that's endogenous to yeah whether people are doing things differently. Yeah. yeah. Cool. 
Brilliant. Okay, so uh, another question from the Q and A. So, um, uh, what to, uh, this is from Charlotte Hemmerich. So, what to do about vaccinating countries with a bad history or a history of slavery? Um, we cannot change the past, but how can we uh, help now? What do we do to get over these um, these situations? Yeah. So, so, so I think what's super important in that case is this is just conjecture is um, information provision. So if you if if you think about um, NGOs or governments today in providing vaccinations or health health services, I think there's not as much um, emphasis or resources devoted towards teaching people or um, communicating with people as as there could be right and so there's a lot of you know a, a lot of myths so with Ebola there was um, beliefs that um, this was a plot by the West to gain individuals body parts which were being sold and a lot of things like this and the you know the only solution I can think of is is communication and a dialogue and uh, that's costly. And so there's uh, opportunity costs on the part of doctors and nurses and uh, NGO workers. But, um, but I think if it's ignored, then, um, yeah, then it can do more harm than good. And I think that's one thing which we don't understand now. We usually think of four and eight, great. Uh, it might not be perfect, but the more it can help, you know, even if it's imperfect, it might help a little bit. But I don't think we talk, think about, well, what are the detrimental effects of an aid project, which doesn't go great? And how's that going to affect uh, things in, in future generations? And with the colonial medical campaigns, that's just a very extreme version. But uh, is that going on on a smaller scale with different projects uh, around the world, right? And so, and, and there's not much done to evaluate projects, actually, um, in general. So as, as, as we all know. So yeah, so I think that's, that highlights the importance of evaluation, thinking hard, communicating with the local populations, bringing local populations in at all stages, including local academics. I think that's, yeah, that's uh, highlights the importance of that too. And you mentioned that you're working uh, in the Congo now. Are these, are those the kinds of practices you're trying to uh, instill and engage with in terms of having intellectual development on the the side of people you're working with and reporting back results and all those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one thing that's super important is, um, you know, for various reasons uh, to to interact and engage with the local populations and work with local local academics and local individuals. Um, so, uh, yeah, so for, for for those reasons and also I think just um, understanding local local cultures is really is essentially impossible if you're coming at it from a Western framework or with your Western men mentality where you, there's a lot of assumptions which are uh, which you don't even know you're making <laughs> about <laughs> human behavior and that sort of thing um, and so yeah I, I think it's 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 really important just to understand yeah the local population as well brilliant okay um, uh, just uh, aware of the time what I'm going to do is give you three three questions at the same time <laughs> um, and maybe you can provide some brief answers uh, to either of them so uh, the first one uh, uh, I'll paraphrase as saying so you talked about um, ethnic groups potentially being traumatized by historic bad events um, that can last for generations um, other examples um, where if people be encouraged to follow certain practices that have led to, to large rewards. So I guess they're positive, positive examples as well as negative. Um, uh, and there's a question about whether uh, you think that climatic instability is a causal factor um, in things like uh, indigenous language loss, um, or is it just correlational? Um, and then the last question I'll ask is um, around um, issues to do with uh, female choice and short-term mating um, and the, any potential relationships to economic growth uh, and uh, and societal peace uh, and if there are um, uh, previous work and, and data sets on on those things so <laughs> okay <laughs> disparate <Yeah>. questions <laughs> <laughs> yeah um 
Okay, let me tackle the first two because I don't know that I know of a data set that's for, for the third one. Um, good events, yeah, so it's for some reason they're harder to think of, but, the, but there are a few papers recently um, mostly related to aspirations. And I don't know if we think of this as mismatch, but it's, it's, you know, it's an intervention, it's temporary, but it has persistent impacts. Um, so there's a study that, uh, there's a recent movie, people may have seen it, called The Queen of Katwe, uh, which is about, yeah, a, a, I, think, I can't remember if it's in Uganda, but it's about a chess player uh, who, who does, a female chess player does really well from the slums uh, in, in that country. And so that's, that was shown randomly to individuals, and then they examined the academic performance of girls afterwards that saw this and, didn't, and found that that improved, actually, that their academic performance improved a lot. I believe, particularly in math, there was another study similar, but for the Cosby show amongst African-Americans uh, within the United States. And there's a neat instrument that was used um, for that, uh, speaking of instrumental variables. And uh, what you found is that effect, you know, the, the story that comes from that is that effect affected or improved the aspirations of uh, African Americans because it was uh, Bill Cosby or um, Mr. Huxtable, who was a doctor and uh, upper middle class in Chicago, I believe it was. Um, and then another, another example is from Brazilian soap operas, um, which is, this has been studied by Eliana La Ferreira. Brazilian soap operas which they tend to show uh, individuals <coughs> which are in urban settings and have small families. And so they found that basically the effect that had was to lower fertility rates, right? And again, that's, yeah, so that's, so, so those are some examples of, of um, you know, at least interventions or, or uh, uh, factors having what we might think of as positive, positive effects, right? And so maybe one way to think of it is those are, fighting back against mismatch that, that these perceptions were, yeah, uh, were wrong and then we're moving, moving closer to accurate perceptions. And then, and then just the last one really quickly, I, yeah, I, th I think the instability um, mechanism is causal just because humans aren't, I think, aren't realistically affecting the intergenerational variability of the climate, right? There's the migration issue, but I don't think, uh, I don't know if that induces uh, bias, but um, so so the climate is exogenous, and so anything that follows from that we take as causal, right? If it was a case that humans were causing the climate, people in a grid cell caused their climate, then we'd be worried, right? But otherwise, I think we can take it as causal. Brilliant. Okay. First, well, thank you so much for that, Nathan. I think we'll uh, we'll call it a, a day there. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for answering all those questions um, in depth. Um, uh, Sergey or Eric, do you want to come in and uh, no, thank well, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nathan. Yeah, it, it's been great and we hope to see people next time when uh, Kristen Hawkes uh, will be given a talk. Same time next Tuesday. So yeah, uh, yeah so thanks for everybody and hope to see you next week. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thank Nathan. Nathan. It's been Fantastic. great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers.